Namaste. I'm Cecile, by the way. It's nice to meet you in person, and I'm privileged to introduce in brief the PSG group this afternoon. Am I doing it right? Okay. All right. Okay. So who are the PSGs? Uh, what's in the PSG? Let's see. Okay. Uh, we are supposed to be a, a support, a group of supportive colleagues. Okay. Supportive in a sense that we lend, we lend our friendly eyes to researchers and writers needing help. And in that sense, we call ourselves a wingman, wingman, okay, for or because we do reading and review work for <clears throat> researchers and writers. We are not, however, uh, vetters nor editors. We don't reject, okay? We are not judges and we don't do spell check, all right? We don't do that. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, we do support, advise, and motivate, and suggest uh, some hints, give some support on how to improve work. And am I blocking the way? Yes, okay. So we, we, yeah. We, there we are. We're good. Right. We're back. No, I don't want to see myself. Okay. We do work. We do help from, what do we need this? Uh, ah, okay. Sorry, one second, one second, one yeah. <clears> second. <throat> from, yes, we help from the abstract stage to completed manuscripts. And then at some point, we try to revive manuscripts that have been rejected in order to put them back to life or to merit some kind of a, um, submission to qualify for submission again. So in general, the PSG does tailored and general advice. We do have an a, a line of online volunteers and give live and volunteer sessions and writers workshop and do free online P, P, um, workshops. <clears throat> we do have the YouTube channel all right, where uh, that serves a repository for ongoing or past and ongoing PSG uh, activities. We do these be these because PSG believes the ideas of writers are worth merit and their voice should be heard. And all along the way, we work with the writers along the painful task of improving the writing style because collaborative writing and peer editing are very, very essential, we believe. Now the frequently asked questions are, yeah, is my work for master's thesis or general art school? Where do I start? Okay, is my is this article good enough or clear enough, interesting enough? How can I improve certain parts of the manuscript? Are my discussions and conclusions okay? All these are uh, typical questions that PSG um, received very often. So yeah, where do I start? How do I improve my article? Okay, are my are the different parts of my discussions and conclusions especially uh, okay for a publication? We do work with the authors to reflect on these items to before submitting the paper. Okay, so without much ado, let me introduce the first panelist, Mr. Michael Joseph. Okay, Joseph, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, uh, Michael is a lecturer in content and language integrated learning and academic communication at several universities, okay, in Japan, research centers yeah. in Japan, I'm sorry. His primary research interests are second language, pedagogical acquisition, curriculum development and design, and intercultural communication. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Michael. I'm here to, uh, I see my role as a cheerleader. <laughs> so I'll try my best to cheer, okay? So this is what I experienced based on the process, right? And I find, uh, I'm gonna share you my reflection of the process, what I think worked, what, 
I think could be uh, further improved, right? Uh, so I've learned that writing is actually rewriting. Right, there's lots of rewriting. And it started off um, with a little bit of, um, I'm gonna skip this bit, right? Me having a, a paper, right, that I was working on, and that paper was rejected, okay? And was rejected on the basis, it was submitted to a journal reading as a foreign language, which is one, one of the top tier journal, right? It was rejected, but before it was rejected, obviously it was accepted by the editor. He liked the paper, mm -hmm. submitted to the reviewer. So there were two reviewers. The first reviewer accepted it. The second reviewer uh, disagreed that it wasn't a good fit, right? And rejected the idea of it uh, being uh, that critical thinking was actually important for language learning. Uh, much less in the case of reading, right? So it's very interesting to see the views of two reviewers. So I thought um, a friend of mine, a colleague, he suggested, why don't you submit this paper to the peer support group, right? Since uh, I thought that I'm gonna bury this paper, right? Why don't you submit it to the peer support group and get an alternative point of view, right? So uh, that I did, right? Um, and just a little bit uh, about the paper that I was working on, right? It's about uh, supporting metacognitive engagement mm -hmm. okay, in outdoor readers, right? It's a very nuanced area using Socratic thought, right? So the most people think that if we could discuss Socratically, then maybe that's a good precursor to then write an essay critically. Right, so that connection between talking, discussing, and thinking, right, can be brought into writing. So what I'm suggesting was um, um, doing the same thing, where you talk Socratically, right, after you read a text, okay. So and then you synthesize the understanding of the text based on conversations about the text. But this is done through Socratic talk, right. So this was the paper uh, that we work on. So, it, and this was actually an actual classroom research that was done, right, uh, back in Singapore. Okay, uh, it was done in our high school, and they are out two learners of English, although they study English as a first language, but it's taught as an L two pedagogically, right. And so I've tried that approach, got some results, right. So this was. The reading comprehension test, the questionnaires, collect the data, and then you collect, you know, the standard things that we do, semi-structured interviews, and process it, right? So the whole process revolves around a simple framework of how do we refine our thinking strategies when we read something, okay? And then how do we talk about what we read? So that we can make more gains critically about the text, right? Now, this seems to be quite a big jump. So you need to scaffold it, right? Mm -hmm. So teacher training is required to do this. And this approach is actually very well known in Australia, right? It's called the philosophy for children uh, approach. So my experience using the program, right? Submitted the paper, right? And uh, I thought that the first reviewer was great. He was very critical um, about the um, quantitative results, right? So I think one of the best things about the review was that it's couched in the language, a neutral language, right? Uh, and it's very targeted. The comments are very targeted, making suggestions. And that's precisely what we want. We want reviewers to just keep asking as much questions as you can. Right? Not, I mean, it would be a bonus if they give a suggestion, but the more questions that is being asked gives a chance for me as the reader, as the writer, to know what my reader is thinking. Right? So I have that relationship with my reader, that writer reader relationship, which the PSG support group provides. Right? So, because we write to an audience, isn't it? So, so this is a triangular process, right? So the writer's voice, right? Writing to the reader, reader gives his perception of the reality of the subject and see whether we can triangulate this through the questions and 
that the uh, reviewer saw. Now the second reviewer was, I, I think it was less, less targeted comments. And I think, but it was a necessary role that was played, which is encouraging comments, right? So the second review provided encouraging remarks. So that sort of balance it out, isn't it? You want great criticality, right? And you want to couch it with some motivation for the reader to pursue and see that the end life cycle of the paper reaches into publication, right? So here's my thought about it. After going through this process and reflecting on it, it made me realize four things, right? So when I read a text, right, I, I read as a reader, right? And then when I write it, I'm writing um, as a writer, okay? So what it does in this process, it got me to think how to write like a reader, okay? Write like a reader. In other words, write to that imaginary audience who is going to process it, right? So it encourages me to write as a reader and eventually write as a writer where I find my own voice, right? So that process, right, is a very um, integrative process. Uh, and I think future reviews could look at how to strengthen right, the voice in academic prose rather than just look at um, academic style, but how to strengthen that voice. I think that requires reviewers to ask questions about whether they are really persuaded at the end of that reading, how would you rate the level of persuasiveness as, as one reviewer? That, that might be good. You know? um, yeah, so I think it was really good uh, experience. I recommend it to anyone. Um, and eventually the paper reached the end of its life cycle and it was published in the Critical Thinking and Language Learning Journal. Right, so thank you very much. Congratulations. Yeah. Yay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing. Yes. I, I'm going to talk to you later about your research. Oh, it's okay. very similar to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll probably will discuss that later. Hi. Hi, welcome. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go on, move on to the our second panelist. Jer Mr. Jerry oh. Delandis is currently as a professor at the University of Toyama. So do you want to get a photo with Michael now? He's just sat down. Do you want to stand up for a second just while the official photographer's in the room? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind. Yeah, and jump, with, jump. with yeah, <laughs> Professor Delandis here. Great. Really appreciate it. All right. Jump, um, jump the front of your slide <laughs> Maybe. There you go. Yeah, join him. Okay. All right. His uh, professor Radis's interests uh, focus on communicative language teaching and blended learning, as well as learner autonomy. Well, pragmatics, action research, and language testing. Oh, I'm sorry. He's been active in JOLT since 1999. Well, right. yeah, even yes. before then, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. In JOLT publications. Oh, publications. Thanks for your service. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. So, yeah, I've been uh, in JOLT publications, mostly with TLT. Mm -hmm. I've had all roles. I was a uh, proofreader and copy editor and column editor, journal editor, and pubs board chair, and I'm a reviewer stuff. And uh, now I'm the pubs liaison. So I'm, I'm really excited to uh, have my 15 minutes. <laughs> I was asked to um, talk about uh, navigating the writing process and the role of feedback and peer support, okay? So um, I was tasked to cover these topics. And as you can see, the, the each one could be a full presentation. So when I saw I got 15 minutes and I got to cover these four, how am I going to do that? So I, I was thinking, thinking, and it, just this image of, of like making maple syrup came to mind. You know, you've got all kinds of information and all kinds of things you could say, but you just have to boil it down. What's the essence here? And I'm trying to think about that. So I've come across some images and imagery that I think come to mind on each of these topics. And I'd like to share in sort of a way of 
trying to get at larger things with fewer words. <laughs> we'll see if it works or not <laughs> and, uh, anyway. So here we go. So first about the role of constructive feedback. What is constructive feedback and why is it important? Well, obviously it's really important. One image that comes to mind is constructive feedback as a compass, right? So if you're a new author and you're just getting started with academic writing, it's really hard to know how to write in this way. It's, it's very different than casual writing. You have lots of expectations. You have to meet certain standards. You've got to do data and all of that. And it's really hard. And so you write something, you don't know if it's good or not. And so without the feedback, how are you going to find your way? Hence the compass metaphor there. Another one is critical mirror. All right. So, so in this critical doesn't mean like criticize, but more like being able to see your strengths and your weaknesses. What are the things that you're doing well? And a good reviewer will always be able to point out what you're doing well, even if 90% of it is not really great, but you, you have to be able to focus on all aspects in order to promote growth, right? And so, so you can see the good with the bad and from this process, you can really learn. So take, you, you take these two things together and this lighthouse image comes to mind. Like, so without, without like if you're a new author and you're trying to write and you put yourself out there and you write and you get feedback and people say, it's great, wow, wonderful. Okay, or it's terrible, oh no. Like, but you can write, something great and you get 99 comments that are positive and you get one that's half critical what's the one that you remember mm -hmm. it's that half critical one like mm -hmm. when we put ourselves out there we're so vulnerable to judgment and it's a it's there's a connection between what we put out in the world and our identity we all have fragile egos and whatnot mm -hmm. and it's really really hard to navigate the stormy seas and then go in my over the top metaphors, but it, you get you get the idea, right? So it's, I just wanna get to the, like, there's an emotional component to, to the work that a reviewer does and that, that you're catching someone at a real vulnerable moment in their career and that really positive, well-written, good feedback can really help somebody. It makes it, you have a profound impact on someone's career in a sense. And conversely, you can really mess someone up, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you, a badly reviewed paper, you know, or incomplete or incoherent uh, feedback can really set someone back. And so it's, it's really important to think about that. So what are some uh, techniques that good peer review people do? So I'd like to draw upon an article from the writer's workshop that Kinsella and I wrote mm -hmm. in the uh, language teacher. So this topic was very interesting, uh, peer reviewing to improve your writings. So the idea here is that if you're an author, if you understand the work that peer reviewers do, it can give you insight into writing better and what to expect from the process, right? So one, one basic idea is that peer support is a collegial and social process. It's not about getting like commands from someone, Don't, please tell me what to do. No, it's not like that. It's, it's a two-way street, right? So you're developing this sort of connection with someone. It's also the peer reviewer's basic job is just to promote clarity and understanding. And that's the core of it right there. So when you're submitting a paper, you need to keep that in mind that the comments you get, this is what they're trying to help you with. Yeah. So even if it's critical, if you understand that, then that can, that can help you out, right? So good reviewers are trained in the golden rule. Don't be mean, don't be a jerk, right? Be kind and be helpful. A good reviewer has the best interests and doesn't, spends time with a paper and just doesn't say it's great or it's bad or, and, or give vague comments. They, they, they are trained in techniques that help promote learning and self-awareness and growth. For example, if you get a well-reviewed paper, you can get this benefit as an author. So things like, you can get help with structuring your conclusions, uh, clarifying your data. A good review can help improve writing style. It spots gaps in logic. This is really critical because you're the expert in your topic and you know every little detail, but you may not be aware of things that the uh, audience doesn't know, right? So that's what the reviewer's job is to kind of spot those logic gaps. And it can help you suss out data and uh, identify any limitations you may have, right? Which is always a critical component of a good paper. Like it's never ever perfect and you have to identify that, right? So 
Some of the techniques that, uh, that are used are praise, criticism, pairs. This is a classic, right? You, you want to, overall, it's great, but, you know, that kind of structure, right? Uh, use of modal and frequency, or perhaps you could, or, you know, kind of making suggestions instead of commands or, or sharp comments, right? Um, yeah, one idea could be to, right? So these sort of uh, softer language, making requests or hedging devices. And I hope you find my remarks helpful. And then that, that sort of thing softens it. it. It makes it like someone's really trying their best to be balanced and helpful, right? So if you use this type of language, uh, you can you can communicate a lot of useful advice to people, right? So hopefully, as an author, you're you're getting that sort of thing. But it's also really important as an author to remember you're not a passive participant in this process, and that if you really really want to get the most out of a review, you should speak up if you have a question and be active in in this process. Again, it's a collegial process. It's not like you're subservient or in a, a role like that, right? You got to be active in it. Okay, some writing tips. What could you do? Well, there's so many things you can do. But one thing that I see is as a reader, as a reviewer for many years, copy editor, authors frequently don't take that extra step to polish the writing. If you do a wood, I'm, I'm a woodworker, and that's my hobby, making wood, and I've got this orbital sander, right? And so it's really laborious and horribly dusty, right? right? And it's, but after I'm done, and I do it right, it's so polished and smooth, and, and it just takes extra work, right? If you you got to lay down the layer of, of, of lacquer, and then you got to sand it with finer grain, and it's, it's just this whole step by step, and you got to do that, right? And if you do that, you increase your chances of success. You may not be perfect, but if you put that extra effort after you've written it to polish, you can really make a difference. And so in the olden days, People used to use books to acquire knowledge, to get tips on how to write better. For example, strength and write, right? The elements of style, that's a classic one, right? Or Helen Sword, what a, I'm such a huge fan of her. She's amazing, right? Um, she wrote The Writer's Diet, which is, I highly recommend that. I wrote a column in, in the Writer's Workshop about that book and also a website. It helps uh, you really slim down unnecessary text, mm -hmm. chopping off words and this and that. And she points out four different types of, of uh, just verbose, unnecessary language that can be cut and not lost any idea at all. This type of tighter writing, it's like you're gardening and you're taking out brambles and so that the flower, the, the essence of your idea is, is between the words and between the lines. If you remove a lot of extraneous language, you can get the message across more. And then similarly, stylish academic writing goes into more details. It's a really, these are really great. But you know, that's the old days. Now people use fancy AI, right, <laughs> to, to fix writing. This is, uh, this is from Google Docs, mm -hmm. right? I took the column that Kinsella and I wrote and I just highlight the first paragraph. Now, this little thing, this is AI now, Right, built in. So now you can have it adjust tongue, summarize, make it in bullet points, elaborate, shorten, rephrase. This thing can, can fix and polish language now. So this is especially useful for if you, it's not your first language, right? That kind of thing, right? So it's just part of it. And of course, we have ChatGPT now, which is a very powerful tool. And there are many presentations that happening about this. Of course, this, this is a super powerful tool that can be a great boon to, to help with the research process, to help polish writing, but it also can be dangerous too. And so you got to be really aware about this. Um, in terms of publishing and ethics, you guys know COPE, mm -hmm. the Committee of Publication Ethics. That's the, the, the big organization that deals with it. They came out with this position statement on AI. And uh, basically it, it says that... Uh, well, AI tools in the writing of manuscript and da da da, da it's, it's, uh, it must be transparent. And if you're using it, you have to have a statement. Mm. A lot of journals are now basing their policies on this. And so if you're going to be submitting an article and you're going to be using the GPT or other tools, generative AI tools, you need to, you have, you have to just declare that. And in the end, 
in the end, authors are fully responsible for the content of their manuscript, right? So what you put out in the world, it's on you, right? So if you blindly just tell GPT, oh, write my introduction for me, and then you put it out there and it turns out there's some problem with it, that's on you, right? So you have to take care. But I think as long as you do take care, there is a lot of more productive use that this technology can bring us. So that's something to, to explore, all right? Okay, publishing advice. Some points. I, and the main one is to target the publication that you wish to uh, submit to. So this is something a lot of authors do. They treat a, a submission as like a, a resume and they send out the same article to different Art, uh, different journals, but each journal is their own little world and universe with their own remit. You got to tune into that. Okay. So, ways to do that, you got to follow the submission guidelines. Like, absolutely. You got to study them and, and internalize them. And then you need to uh, read articles in the journal. So, you pick up the tone and the flavor and the, and the level. And you need to cite some of the articles in that journal that you're submitting to. That's a really good trick, right? It shows that it shows the editors that you're you're serious about becoming a part of their community, right? Because a journal is like a community, right? And they're trying to build something, and you want to be part of that and show that you're a member of that, right? And if if it's if you're just getting started, collaborate with a more experienced uh, author, right? Someone who's you can be the this, the Kohai in there, the Senpai, mm -hmm. or the Padawan and the Master, or whatever you want to look at, right? Okay. Um, also, a lot of authors, when they submit it, they think it's done, but it's not. The review process has many steps. And even after a paper is accepted, that's actually when the real editing work begins. And so you have to sort of factor that in and know that what you submit is going to be different than what you end up with. For example, at TLT, <laughs> this is the process here. The papers are submitted online, they go through an editorial screening, the editor determines if they're suitable or not, let's say they are. So it's sent out for two rounds of review maximum. The reviewer has three choices, they could accept with minor revisions, or major revisions required, or decline. Okay, so the reviewers decide. If, if the author, if it is uh, if it's this, the author can have a chance to redo it and address the issues in the paper, okay? And then uh, then they can go up to hit this step and then hopefully it'll get over to here. Mm -hmm. But notice that even when it gets here, editorial revision, this is a big step. Mm -hmm. And then the paper goes through the production final publication. A lot of authors give up at this stage. Mm -hmm. We've lost a lot of papers here. So if you're an author and you, you don't get, you don't get like a full rejection you should count that as a win mm. and you should work even harder to address all of the issues mm. don't give up because authors who do that see a really greater range of acceptance so i think that's really important to remember right so i've got a minute left and so uh, it's all the have to cover amazing <laughs> yeah, any any questions or anything so anyway there you go Yes. A really serious question. Sure. With the PSG, yeah. we're, we're supposed to be friendly, <laughs> right? Yeah. We're not supposed to be mean, but you know, when the writer goes for real editing, they really need real serious critical. Parts. Yes, that's right. And that's, that's right. there's a thin line between our job and their job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, it's so hard to give real severe criticisms at this point well, because we want we don't want to get the you know the best opinion. Well, that, that's, that's after all, yeah, later on. That's right. Okay. You you have to you have to criticize with love. I don't know how to explain it. It's an <laughs> no, art. It's, it's, it's an art to be able to 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 be able to do that. But what I think the key is like. If you spend time with the paper and you really think about it, mm -hmm. and you don't just, oh, I've got a million things to do, it's number 29 of my list today, mm -hmm. but you give some paper some time and you do your best, I think that's okay. That's all you can do, right? And I think over time, you can you can get better at it. I think you're right. It the, People are going to get what they get, but if you can point out some of the most obvious things that they're going to face, then I think that's a service that we can give people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think, yeah, 
Say, say what you mean without being mean. Yes, yes. There you go. There you go. That's a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> the modern meaning of critical has been taken to be essentially what negative. You know, in yeah, other words, yeah. talking about the things which are wrong. But um, you know, I read classics way, way back, and at the time Kant's critique of pure reasoning was written, critique basically was accepted to mean a systematic analysis. Yes. Yeah. And that's what critical in this sense really mm -hmm. needs to be. That's right. And you can be systematically analytical and still be nice. Yes. Or you can be a, a real monster yeah. about it. That's you can right. do thing. But the, the key of the process is to be systematic that's about right. it and to spend the time yeah. that it's necessary. To do I think that. it's important to be straightforward and clear with people. If their writing is clearly yeah. substandard, you need to point that out otherwise you're not doing anyone any favors mm -hmm. however that's that's a kind of tough love as long as you balance it with other things that are, they are doing you have to give them something yeah, to, right. to give them hope yeah give yeah. them a path forward yeah. right but you got a lot of work to do on this this is not gonna well nice that's that's a, that's a big debate like, what is nice <laughs> being honest and clear and point and straight and direct is a form of niceness right. don't you think Anyway, I've used my time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Sorry, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. also I had a question for Michael. I took some notes if you if we're still in the question and answer period right there. Michael, you talked about um writing like a writer and reading like a reader as being an actual thing. And you talked about how we need to train ourselves to go write well to teach people to write like a reader. So mm -hmm. we're writing to someone's expectations to align our perception of reality with what I think the person is going to be communicated. And I wonder if you could go into that a little bit more if I was interested in where you can take that. And if you would also see the inverse, we need to read like writers, because I find myself doing that a lot, and it gets in the way of enjoying reading. Yeah, I know, I know this as well. When, when I, uh, I'm quite new, I'm an early career researcher, so I'm quite new to this process. But as I try to piece it up, right, when I try to read an article, right, I normally read it as a reader, right? But I'm also trying to improve my writing. Right? So the next time I read that article, I'm also reading like a writer, so I'm trying to pull out certain important cues and language use, structuring, posturing, you know. Then I would have to write, right? Write this like a reader. Right? Because I would normally write as, a, as, as, as I understand what I've read, and what I want to say, but is it, is it is it comprehensible for the reader? Comprehensibility is it depends on the person reading. It differs from some reviewers might like this, some reviewers might not like this. Right? So, I always have to imagine this, this, this idea of the imagined reader when I'm writing it out. Right? So I, I write it out as a first draft, then I rewrite it, putting on the cap of an imagined reader. Now I'm editing for my reader. Right? So this is very tough to do you see, uh, on yourself because sometimes there's a lot of cognitive biases. So you can't spot certain things like what you mentioned, the logical gap, you know, because it, it appears quite in my mind, right, right, but some some reviewers would require, you know, an appendix. Some reviewers have told me to remove. This is unnecessary, and I go like, "Whoa, really?" <laughs> okay, so it really depends, right? Like what you say, uh, you have to really know that journal because then you you are in touch with that imagined reader. So yeah, I thought, well, try imagine that try to keep rewriting. It's a circle that we go through. Once we are able to write uh, as a reader, then we'll be able to write like a writer. Right? So I think it's this triangulation, constantly trying to 
um, say what we want to say to an audience that can uh, process it and agree with it because ultimately I have to enter that community. So this, this is, I feel, it's a social rhetorical approach where, where we are oh, really joining the community at the same time and also trying to contribute and critique and be a member of that community. So you involve certain kinds of cultural reproduction. Right? So I find it to be a very complicated process. Yeah. We all do. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to come up here and can I use this key too? Yeah, it's connected. Joy, I get to let's see which one? This one? Yeah. There we go. Reflections on feedback. Well, I'm very grateful to both uh, Jerry and Michael for a lot of the content provided because you focused a great deal on how it's a relationship that we have to build between reviewers and readers, excuse me, I'll use readers and writers in this case. And that relationship, the understanding that's going on is a big part of the research project, which reflections on feedback is what Kinsella, Beth, and I, Josh, have been doing for it's about two years now. Kinsella, right here, remember more than that. Um, problem statement, which is where we began with this, trying to understand what's going on with uh, both readers and writers in the PSG, the answer right here, PSG services are not very well known and referrals through word of mouth. These are kind of structural things related to the PSG itself. And then looking at writers, a lot of new writers feel unqualified. Jerry focusing on understanding that there was a big thing there. Readers may also feel intimidated in the process and your description of your experience when you wrote that first article and submitted it like it seems to fit really well here and then the psg itself lacks human resources we need more readers because jerry you were talking about needing to spend time with a paper right and spending time with a paper when you have just a few people doing the reading is next thing to impossible to do the psg needs more volunteers and more active people involved and i think kinsella would probably echo this about three times she could right here heading it up. Moving along here, what is the PSG research project? Okay, right below this title, when I click this, you'll see a list of videos. And you're wondering, okay, when this is a research project, why do we have a list of videos here? These are three of the four workshops that the PSG has conducted so far this year. We've got another one coming up on December 2nd that are the result of an approach that the research project tried to take to bringing readers and writers together. With Kinsella's leadership, we looked at this idea and we said, okay, we need to encourage writers. We need to encourage them to give us papers and to write more. And we need to advise the readers on how to better relate with them and provide them with feedback and improve the process that brings them together and allows them to communicate and the result of that was in choosing to invite talented people, like the ones who provided the uh, talk so far and Chilana White, who's gonna give the one on December 2nd, to help connect and advise people on better techniques to do that uh, and just give them information that's necessary for it. We've gone here, how do we do this? Well, the section that I'm gonna be talking about, Beth will cover what's Next is a survey of PSG readers, in which we analyzed feedback types and examined feedback best practices in light of that. To give you a little bit of information, it's a reader survey. It was a Google form. We sent it out and people sent back their responses. And I should read a little bit more. There was a, br a broad uh, range of responses with some people who have more than 10 years of experience in academic reviewing and writing, and some people who had none. And you, as you can imagine, dealing with this sort of balance in the PSG, this sort of range, I think is a better way of putting it, it can be a little bit difficult. The results that we see right here, we asked, what aspects of the text do you tend to focus on most when giving feedback? This is to the readers. You can see this statistically, in-text citations, conclusion, and discussion. One overall, but literature review and introduction were also pretty high. 
up there in terms of what readers looked at. A lot of other areas, including some which were a little bit less, less textually oriented, like flow and structure and the writing and the flow itself, didn't seem to get looked at a lot. And we aren't really sure what to make of that yet, but this is what the readers are telling us. So can I jump in just for a second? Go ahead. I think those last two options, those are what the readers typed in. Those are uh, the options for okay. them to select. That was something that they wrote. You're right. I think I missed that. Okay. <laughs> She's always right. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> You'll learn. Okay. Uh, <laughs> teach me, Sensei. Um, another question we used was uh, we asked people to agree or disagree with the statement here and the Likert scale. I was already confident my abilities to provide actual feedback on academic manuscripts before joining the PSG. Now, we had some real veterans. So before joining the PSG was a little bit vague, but we also had some new people. And only 50% uh, were very negative. I really wasn't confident at all. There were a few more responses that were more confident, but still nobody was extremely confident beforehand, which was interesting since many of them were experienced academics. And then here, the inverse, in a way, my reviewing skills have improved as a result of being a PSG volunteer. There was some improvement, Definitely some, but not as much as you would like to see. And one of the things that the research project is looking at is how this sort of thing can be improved. Items that were mentioned by people, those who disagreed had previous experience providing feedback and 50% agreed they had started with it. But we found that PSG training materials were not necessarily accessed a lot by people and that the intake process maybe needed some more work. So this is some of the stuff that we've just looked at statistically right here. And Beth, take over the writer survey side. Okay. So we also created a similar survey to send out to the writers who were submitting our paper, their papers to us for review. Very similar structure. They had a Likert scale where they selected strongly disagree to strongly agree. We had our demographics questions and our questions about what aspects of their publication they wanted the reviewers, the readers to focus on. Okay, so we also had a range of writer experience, quite a large range. We had a sorry, small percentage that said less than a year. The majority of people said between three to five years. And we had one person six to 10 and another percentage here, 16 plus years experience as a writer, academic writer. And most of the respondents had also published at least one paper. Uh, only one, the small percentage here, 16.7 blue, dark blue, said they hadn't had any publications. And then most of the people had not had their publication, their manuscripts published after the PSG review. They may uh, be in process of editing these papers. It doesn't necessarily mean that the feedback wasn't important, just their pub papers haven't been published at this point. One person or this small percentage, 16.7 said, yes, I have had my paper published. Now we were also very interested to see what the writers expected from the reviewers. What part of your paper do you want the most feedback on? Similarly to what the readers said they focus on, uh, the discussion and the literature review, the discussion section for the readers was rated higher, um, highly, and also their conclusion was highly rated as what they wanted more feedback on. Not so much with in-text citations. I think maybe in-text citations are easy focal point for our reviewers. I wanna make sure that all of the in-text citations are listed in the bibliography. I wanna make sure they're listed properly. It's just something that when you're familiar with the APA, it's something you look for, but it's not necessarily something that the writers wanted feedback on. And the feedback that I received from the PSG readers has enabled me to strengthen my manuscript. We had a mixture of responses. One person, or this small percentage down here at the bottom, 
uh, strongly disagree. 16.7, This these respondents had um, negative experience with the PSG because we did not have any available volunteers at this time. So no one was available to read their manuscript, manuscript and provide feedback. So, uh, but the people who did have reviews and did receive feedback, they felt, tended to feel that their manuscript was strengthened because of that, because of that feedback that they had received. Now, this is a big point that we know we need to work on. We need to work on how much time we spend, how much time our volunteers spend on a manuscript. But even with the respondents, they said, I'm busy. I can't promise I can volunteer as a reader for the PSG. We asked them, would you like to become a PSG reader and help other people in the same situation as yourself? No, I don't have time. A few people said this. So I think everyone feels this crunch. But when you're a writer, you expect to get feedback very quickly on your manuscript. And that's something that we do not have the capacity to do in every situation. We work as hard as we can to get them out in a timely manner, but it's not always feasible depending on the time. So again, their comments on how to improve PSG, they want a shorter turnaround. Um, some of the writers also mentioned it was hard to contact the PSG through the JALT website. We do have our own section on the JALT website and they have a, a box, a submission form that they send from our webpage, but they would like other outlets to communicate with us, not just from this form. They also requested more frequent updates on whether or not a reader had volunteered to read their manuscript. That is something we can feasibly do uh, every week hey, no one has volunteered to read your paper yet. Just giving them these more frequent updates. It's something that we can change to help them. And finally, some of them wanted to say thank you to the readers who volunteered. So they would like some uh, recognition to the readers who helped support them. And some of the respondents also wanted suggestions on where they could publish their manuscripts. But going back to what Jerry was saying, each journal has their own culture. So it, it may be difficult for our reviewers to, to recommend these publications. For the future of the PSG, what we are hoping to accomplish by getting all of this data from our readers and our writers we want to develop a feedback tool to help support the readers, to help make the process more streamlined. Okay, so if we want to ask questions, ask questions to the writer, we could ask the readers, what are three questions you would like the writer to clarify? Make it more streamlined, make it simple and clear on what their responsibilities are and how the readers can help support the writers a little bit more. We always want our readers to provide the writers with user-friendly feedback, <laughs> very clear, very concise, and polite. Maybe nice is not the right word, polite at least. Um, nothing very sharp. <laughs> and we are providing more opportunities for professional development. We're hosting these professional development workshops where we have speakers coming and talking about their experience as editors, as readers, and as writers. We have not yet provided reader and writer socials where they can interact more on a friendlier basis, but we're all spread out all over Japan, some people outside of Japan as well. And we are working on acknowledging our readers' efforts more. So Q&A for me and Jeff. <laughs> Questions? I have answers. <laughs> Maybe not the right answer, but I have answers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you mentioned this whole range of readers, we say that the PSG, mm -hmm. the very experienced ones and the beginners, so to speak. Uh, in the first question that we raised, 
did you see a difference in what the focus of experience and meaning feelings are when they do the feedback? Okay. The very first question. They focus more on writing stuff or discussion or methodology. Mm -hmm. Across, so across the board. Across the board. It was cross There really wasn't anything I mean, that. Yeah. yeah. Everybody did seem to prefer uh, I think most of them these quite strongly. Yeah. There wasn't really a clear trend we would see between experience and experience and trends, which leads me to believe either one of two things. Either readers are all fairly similar in their approach, or we're not asking the right questions to mm -hmm. distinguish yeah. between what results from having more experience here versus a less experience here. Yeah. And I think either of those potentially true. Yeah. Definitely every most people thought the discussion, the conclusion were the most important parts of a manuscript. I would venture to say that the literature review being so high, it was rated so highly from the experienced reviewers. I feel like the literature review, it makes or breaks the manuscript. And I think if someone has less experience, they may not understand the importance of the lit review. It's closer to 100 now, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Uh, my 300 page dissertation. Yeah. Which is what we're going to talk about later. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? No, we're good. What were some suggestions from a couple of people who are experienced? Yeah. <laughs> Don't call on him. He's just enjoying the vibing, okay? Yeah. So definitely. The question, yeah. uh, that I remember there was a question that was asked, which was, what did you like the reviewers to the focus on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's really an important question, isn't it? So that um, it's uh, if the writer gets the feedback that they oh, they want uh, mm -hmm. from, then you kind of, in a way, have satisfied what they were looking out for, at least based on where they are. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that might be, uh, that might satisfy them, but I, I do. There should I, be more I, to it. Yeah, I do prefer, like what she mentioned, um, I do prefer to see, I mean, this is me personally, it's going to be different for different. I do prefer a uh, reverse critique on the methodology mm -hmm. so that I know the paper doesn't go flat, mm -hmm. right? That I do prefer a critique on the references mm -hmm. so that I know, um, like some suggestions that you made regarding my ideas, but we put some citations in the journal. Just that no, I think it's mm -hmm. very important. Because uh, it points them to the right direction. You don't need, don't need to say anything much, just pointing them to the right direction. Or whether the, um, I, I think it depends on the reviewers, uh, a of expertise. Right? Yeah. I mean, if they could critique the references for this relevant, mm -hmm. that would be great. There's but also a mismatch of what the, re what the readers say, what they comment on, and what the writer's expectations are, there was a lot of mismatch between that and the survey too. So a lot of the writers, they said, I wanted more focus on my flow and my voice, but like, what's the important thing? Like, yes, your voice showing up in your manuscript, but if there are significant problems, the yeah. reviewer should focus on that a little bit more. Yeah. I think I leave it to the benefit of the review. I always look at every review in a very positive part. The learning experience kind of thing. Yeah. I always yeah. look at it in a positive way, so it's never negative. That is not a universal attitude. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, but when you said that, eventually everyone will get to that attitude through hard struggles because if, if you keep trying to do something and you're not open to critique, yeah. you're going to keep getting critiques until you're going to finally be opened by force. So if one way or another, you're just, you're way ahead of it. 
that, that kind of open attitude is really important for me. So no matter what, what you get as an author, you should be able to take something from it. Mm -hmm. That's the growth mindset, right? That's, right. That's what we're all about, right? <laughs> we also need to work on our clarity on what services the PSG offers. Some people who submit their articles, they their manuscripts, they want us to edit everything, like just completely change it. Yeah. And that is beyond our scope. <laughs> right. No, it, and... Mm. We're not, we're not in the app chat. Yeah. <laughs> Show you chat GPT. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much to all our speakers today. Um, I would like to wrap up this uh, forum, uh, this our first forum, with a couple of points. Um, uh, this is what we call uh, the AGM, but um, it's literally just uh, an update on how things are going and what we are going to be doing from this point forward. Um, and it's the end of the year, so from this point forward, that means uh, next year. Yes, next year. Okay. So um, just a report. Um, we've had 15 to 17 authors that we helped uh, just between 2022 and 2023, which is almost, I want to say almost eight times as much as what it was the year before. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we have had an uptake in people who would like to make use of our services. Um, not all of them have been helped as, uh, as uh, Bethany mentioned, for one person, we were not able to find volunteers. And actually, it's actually two, because one person decided to send in their manuscript on the 21st of December before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that is not realistic. Mm -hmm. Yes, to expect a quick, a quick response. Um, so uh, we have a, uh, we've had two presentations, one at Pansig and one here at uh, JALT 2023. Um, we have a publication upcoming on our research. Um, we are going to wrap up our sponsored online uh, professional development workshops. We've had three so far, and the final one will be by Chelana White about uh, her journey as a reviewer, um, how it started and how it's going so far. Um, we have... PSG tables, this is something new. We've only had it twice, I believe. Three times? Three times. Three times, yes. Before that, PSG did not have a table. Um, this is because this is a new thing for all committees. Uh, but I, I would like to say we are the, the originators of this trend. Um, many committees are now having their own tables at JALT and PANSIG. Um, uh, the, the, the point of this, uh, table, having a table is of course, promoting PSG and making us visible to everyone. But, uh, most importantly, I would like to keep including the live review, mm -hmm. which is quite a challenge. I have to say for a reader to quickly look at something, listen to questions and then react to that, um, in lieu of just reading the manuscript slowly, looking at all the details and then giving a nuanced comment. But still, it is still very helpful to give the, uh, uh, I guess, the sudden impact of a quick review. And mm -hmm. the the people who came today really did appreciate that and let us know. Um, so um, what is coming next is the ZPD on Zoom um, or, or the Zoom professional development uh, group by JALT. We have joined uh, with um, Q and PANSIG to do live manuscript review sessions. And we're gonna have one on December 12th. Uh, we're gonna have one on uh, January 30th, mm -hmm. I believe as well. Um, yeah, just to keep that trend going, to, to help people who really have a question now, 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 and want an answer now, now, now. Mm -hmm. Um, we are also working with Q and Pansig for abstract writing workshops, which are the other two dates in December and January in which we will do more than just look at manuscripts, give advice and comments. All right. So that's kind of the report section. 
Um, we do want to um, stress, I want to stress that we do need help uh, as um, uh, Jeff and Bethany both mentioned. Um, the committee uh, consists of quite a few people, but there are a few who are very, very active, a few very, very active readers. Um, there are a few members, uh, all present here, mm -hmm. um, almost all present here, who are uh, the driving force behind uh, the rejuvenation of PSG. Um, but we all need help. Um, so I think uh, having a co-chair, which is a new, new, newly defined job, an event coordinator, a publicity coordinator, more readers, of course, and a writer's workshop column editor to assist, yes, um, would would be quite uh, an improvement. So if you are interested in helping out the PSG and perhaps being an active organizer, please feel free to contact us at psg at jobs.org or scan this QR code. Okay. Um, Right. Um, why should you do this? I forgot to mention that. Why should you be part of PSG as an organizer or as a reader? Well, um, writer, writing, de writing development, um, you improve your own writing. You gain new perspectives as both uh, Michael and uh, Jerry mentioned. Um, insider knowledge, content knowledge, things that you can learn before other people hear about it. Um, of course, career professional development, um, network expansion, and actually being able to say, I was of service to my, my community or my language uh, teaching community, whether that's in JALT or not. Um, effect, or should we say effect? Um, definitely motivation and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Hey, I helped this person and they are actually grateful and they have gone on to publish their, their paper. This is this is actually something that cannot be quantified. It, it is quite quite a, a positive experience. Um, support um, at the moment, the training is slowly being developed into something new, a new form. Um, what we do now is we have Zoom training um, for new readers, uh, models, and uh, we are hoping in the future to have mentors. Okay, so um, actually previews of papers are um, in progress is quite a plus as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but that could be counted under uh, insider knowledge. Okay. All right, so uh, once again, PSG works online. If it hasn't been mentioned clearly before, we work online. So wherever you are from, whether you're abroad, whether you're a member of JALT, whether you're um, in Osaka or Hokkaido, um, the PSG helps. Um, I would like to say uh, in the words of uh, some of the great leaders, previous leaders of uh, PSG, um, it's better than face-to-face -to -face <laughs> Just this. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of announcements, if you would permit. Um, <laughs> move a little bit closer. Um, so we have our co-sponsored events. Um, this is a first for PSG where we uh, work together with chapters, the Ibaraki chapter, the Shizuoka chapter, um, the SPINS committee, and the JALT call um, to offer a Zoom professional development um, workshops. The last one in a series of four is with Chalana White. We've said it many times because we are very, very excited about this one. And we really hope to end on a high note. Um, and Chilana is going to talk about her experience as a reviewer. Um, as I also mentioned before, writing support. Um, we are very proud to be working together with Q, uh, one of the largest uh, SIGs in JALT, um, uh, and with PANSIG, which is a, another conference, um, to help them help whoever wants to submit to present with their abstracts. Um, this is a, again, live 
assistance where um, we are on Zoom and people can bring in their ideas, their drafts and discuss, ask questions, um, but also get some advice. Yes. And these are the dates um, uh, that we will be uh, present for. <laughs> All right, so again, if there are any questions, psg at jelt.org. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, and I would like to say, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, audience members. Thank you, yes. speakers. <laughs> and I'll stop here. Yes, already. Yeah. That's a lot of